Well, welcome to Personal Histories. This is actually the tenth interview that uh, we've had on our people, uh, starting with Adele Hoffman, uh, Dale Garrell, Bob Blum, Mike Cohen, Bill Long, Renee Jenkins, Matilda Madaleno, uh, Lisa McInerney, and Marianne Feliz. So we've had some very fascinating uh, histories, and uh, we continue today with uh, one of our outstanding friends and leaders, uh, and that is Dick McKenzie. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said that, um, do something every day that scares you. <laughs> and I think that uh, a lot of the daring of the people that I've interviewed and the daring of being willing to just be open to a discussion like this about one's personal life is kind of a scary <laughs> thing to do. But these are brave people that are willing to do this. So I want to welcome you here now. And um, I think we'll start, as we always do, with your telling a little bit about uh, your ancestors and your early history. So if you can let us know about Canada. Wow. Um, let's see. I, I, I was born in Montreal, and I grew up in Montreal. And you know, I grew up in a family where we, there was five boys and one girl. And uh, none of my brothers or my sister ever graduated from high school. So I was somewhat of an anomaly in the family. And not only was I an anomaly, but you know, it was, I had no real mentors or any models that I could develop myself around. Uh, with none of my family going to college or even finishing high school, uh, I was sort of left to the sort of the environment, so to speak, much as adolescents are today, only my environment was a much safer one. Uh, and I could say that my adolescence was, you know, a pretty normal one. You know, it was a very strong supporting family and uh, a very cohesive community, uh, which uh, provided me opportunity to do the kinds of things that I felt I should be doing. Uh, which is going to school and doing as well as I can in school and probably at the time, I can't remember, but probably at the time with the vision that I would follow on the path of my brothers, that I would probably drop out of school maybe 8th or ninth or 10th grade, get a job and support the family. Um, but somewhere along the way I got sidetracked and I, I think where that occurred was, I know that where that occurred was when I was in 5th grade. I think I said fourth grade, but it was in fifth grade. I was asked to write a composition um, about what I wanted to be when I grew up. <clears throat> I, I didn't know. I, I had no idea of what the options were. So I was out walking with my father, who was really a blue collar worker, and um, you know, serendipitously enough, worked in the loading dock of Merck and Company, who now sponsors the vaccine or now you know, has the vaccine. Uh, and I said, um, Dad, you know, what should I do when I grow up? And at that time, I was doing well in school. Well, he turned to me and he said, you know, whatever you do, you should be your own boss. And I said, well, who's their own boss? I'm very naive as to the working world. And he said, well, you know, people like doctors, lawyers, you know, um, and he named a few more, an architect, things like that. So I said, I think I'll be a doctor. <laughs> like that. I think I'll be a doctor. I mean, I didn't, I, I can't remember ever seeing a doctor, but I said, I think I'd be a doctor. <laughs> and so then I went back to the house after our walk, and we went back, and I sat at the car table in this little, you know, two-bedroom flat with eight people living in there, you know, and don't ask me how we all fit together, but we did. Um, and I started to write my essay. Not knowing anything about it, I was confabulating. And so <laughs> my confabulation ended at the first paragraph because I ran out of words. I didn't know what to say. So I turned to my father and I said, well, I'm stuck. I don't know what to write. So he looks at it and he says, oh, here. And he, so he starts to write. He had this beautiful handwriting, and he would, he'd started to write. And I'd say, gee, that sounds good. And so then I'd write another paragraph, building on his paragraph, and I'd show it to him, and he'd say, no, son, you know, and he'd write some more. Well, it ended up he wrote the whole essay. <laughs> he wrote the whole composition. So I took it to school. I got A-plus on it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, my father had sixth grade education, but he, he, was, he was a wise man. And <clears throat> I got an A plus on it. And because I got an A plus, when the English inspector came around to the, high, to the elementary school and wanted to see how the English teachers were doing in the school, they put my essay on the board, my father's essay on the board. <laughs> and so, and, and the English inspector starts looking at it and starts criticizing it. Well, not only is he criticizing my essay, which is not my essay, but he's criticizing my father. Not only is he criticizing my father, he's criticizing my choice. And I got very defensive. You know, and I mean, I'm not a very outspoken person except when I get defensive. <laughs> yeah. And I got very defensive with this. And the teacher was looking at me like, what happened to quiet Richard, you know? He's suddenly speaking up and defending what he's written. Well, when I left that room, I remember that not only had I made the rational decision to go into medicine, I now made a defensive decision to go into medicine because no one was going to stop me now <laughs> because the English, the English inspector had started to critique how I had not expressed myself right and blah, blah. And from that point on, I was a doctor. I mean, I was living in a, in a, in a neighborhood where there was no professionals. Everybody was a blue-collar worker, and yet here I was what, 14, no, 11 years of age, 12 years of age, Richard the doctor. They were calling me Doc. I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> so the pressure was on. Yeah, right. And what happened then is that I, I befriended a, um, one of my teachers, my seventh grade teacher, who happened to live down the street from where I was living. And we used to walk home from school together, and we would talk. And this, this fellow was named Gus, and he, he, he was... Uh, a very popular uh, character in town. He coached the football team for the local town and whatnot. And so um, we would walk along, and people would say, "Hi, Gus," and I'd say, "Well, there's Gus again." But I, I'm Richard, you know, the doc. You know, I'm Richard the doc. But no, I never really caught on with it with Gus's friends. But we always walked home together, and he, he sort of he became the model for me as an educated man, a man who had gone to college, a man who had chosen to do with his life. Uh, benefiting others through his teaching, and a man who was well accepted and well expressed in his ability to charm and to use his charisma to, to organize and to provide leadership uh, in the community. So anyway, over time, I, I then went to high school, and a year later, Gus transferred to high school. He became a teacher in the high school, and he began touting my my sort of assets. He told tell me, Mackenzie's a great guy, you know, blah, blah. And one of the things, you, if you've ever taken my workshop, I've always said, you know, see the person for who they are. And when I went into my eighth grade class, I remember Mr. Franklin, who was the eighth grade teacher, turned to me and says, oh, no, not another Mackenzie, you know? Mm. Like my two brothers were ahead of me. That means not another Mackenzie. I'm probably going to fail out in ninth year. Well, I proved him wrong. I went to ninth year, 10th year, 11th year. And Gus sort of followed me and, and encouraged me along the way and encouraged me to become part of a football team. And I played football for a couple of years. And Gus, amazingly, I really feel my life, my life was governed by serendipity. Mm -hmm. Really by serendipity. It, you know, I, I really would encourage people, instead of saying no to opportunity, always say yes. Because you always have the opportunity to say no again down the road. But I've said yes to so many things, I, I, I don't think I was wise enough to say no. <laughs> I didn't know what was down the road. I was just saying yes to everything. So Gus turned to me and he says, I'm going down to Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick, and I'm going to be the football coach there. You're a football player. Why don't you when, you, when you finish 11th and 12th grade, come down and play football down there? It was perfect for me. I had no idea how it even apply for college. You know, coming from a family that was just very proud of me, but not very helpful in terms of getting through the little, little uh, transitions in life. So off I went to Mount Allison, and I became you know, a football player for a year and tore my, my, medial, my, medial, uh, my medial cruciate and stopped playing football. And, uh, but I was a football, I became the football trainer for, for all, the, all, all the team, and because I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> I was going to be a doctor. And I did that, and then I, I, I became sort of a little bit of a BMOC, a big man on campus. You know, I became head of this and head of that. And it was all by serendipity. All by serendipity, people would say, you know, would you run for this? And I'd say, sure, I'll run for that. And I, I class president, president of men's council, president of the, all of those things. And 
I mean, I really, I, was, I, was, I wasn't sort of feeling confident in what I was doing, but I just felt it was opportunity. I was a yes person. Um, and then I, I, I guess probably my, my first, con my first uh, sort of confrontation with, with reality was when, you know, after doing all of this and with this person, Gus, as my mentor model, I, in, in the fourth year in university, they they uh, they choose the outstanding student of the four years, and and uh, again, it was something that I felt maybe you know with all of the time I'd put into it, I would get it, and uh, but I wasn't focusing a lot on it. It was just something that I thought people were saying, "I'll be you, Dick," you know, blah blah blah. And it turned out they chose somebody else, and I, you know, that was fine. The, the person they chose was a very good person, uh, Ed Rieger. And, but I found out that the biggest opposition to my choice was Gus, my mentor. He's <clears throat> he sat on the council and he fought against me getting the award, and I couldn't understand that. And you know, he, when I confronted him after, and as I said before, this was a nice, uh, a nice affrontation to me is that you know, reality. There's pain in the world. There's there's unfairness in the world. And you know, I, I said him. At, I, I said, you know, I, I'm not supposed to know this, but one of the other people on the committee told me that you had uh, fought against me being chosen for the Don Norton Award. And I, and he said, well, yeah. He said, you know, you hadn't played football for two years. You weren't an all-around person in that respect. And and what I really found out was that I think Gus was really promoting the concept of he was a football coach. He won the football player to win the award, so that would raise the esteem 